this seminar. It's great to see all of you again uh, in this virtual form. So uh, some of you may have heard me uh, talk about this, uh, in, I mean, in several, on several occasions, uh, but hopefully I'll give you a di slightly different presentation today. Uh, well, certainly the format is different. Uh, so I'm gonna try to, uh, well, before I forget, by the way, so this is joint work with Sherry Gong and Bo Liang Yu. And uh, so I will start just by uh, stating the main goal here, which is the rational strong logic of conjecture. Well, this is, uh, you may probably, you can probably say that this is a technical uh, conjecture. Uh, you, you see some, some uh, very unfamiliar symbols here. So I figured maybe it's better if I present this technical statement first, when you guys are still, uh, you guys still have patience to, to follow. If I do this five minutes later, maybe I'll just lose you. So, okay, so let's start with this definition and then uh, I'll talk about some motivations. Maybe let me uh, zoom in a little bit. Sorry. Uh, okay, anyway. So the rational strong logical conjecture is one uh, very important conjecture in NCG, non-commutative geometry. So the statement is following. So it, it states that the following rational Baumkong assembly map is injective. All right, so what does it mean? Well, at the surface level, it just says we have this map. It's a map between abelian groups, all right? Uh, and we want this abelian, this map to be injective. It's a homomorphism. So the left-hand side over here is, uh, the left-hand side is the K homology. So this K here represents the K homology. Uh, and uh, for the experts, this is K homology with compact supports. I'm using a tablet, so my handwriting is probably not, uh, not optimal. Welcome tablet. And uh, this B gamma is so-called the classifying space of a group gamma. Oh, I should say this is for any countable group gamma. We have the following uh, map. So this B gamma is so-called the classifying space. Of gamma. It's just a topological space and has the following property. So it's a quotient of a contractible space called the universal space of gamma, where this gamma acts on this universal space uh, by a free and a proper action. So you can think of uh, B gamma as a, as a C double complex whose universal cover, the so-called uni universal space, has a gamma free gamma action, simplicial action. So in a sense, this universal space is a very large space. When I think of uh, if gamma is the group Z, then we can take uh, B gamma to be the universal space, which is R mod Z, where this R has an action of Z by translation. So this action is a free action. It's very spread out. But on the other hand, R is contractible. So uh, the universal space, although has a, has a, a a free action by the group gamma, it's at the same time similar to a point from a topological point of view. So that's the classifying space. And we're taking the K homology, it's a kind of extraordinary homology, homological theory uh, of this space, this is a topological space. All right, so this is uh, the domain of, of our uh, assembly map. Uh, it's a abelian group, so we can view this as a, as a Z module. We can apply tensor uh, product with the rational numbers. So what this effectively does is really kills all the torsion. So that's what this uh, tensor does. Let me see if I can use my highlighter. That's okay. Right. So this part is uh, really it kills the torsion. While the right-hand side, this K here stands for K theory. And 
this guy here, hopefully you have seen this before. That's the group, uh, reduced group ceased algebra of gamma. Reduced group C star algebra. And again, you are killing all the torsion by tensoring with the rational numbers. So at the end of the day, it's just a map between two uh, Hebelian groups. So you may ask, okay, uh, well, certainly, I'm not going to tell you the other technical details of this, how to construct this map. That would take uh, a whole day probably. But I'm just gonna tell you uh, on a very uh, intuitive level, what this map really is signifying is, uh, why is it important? So uh, we explained both parts. So the left-hand side really gives you some topological information. It feels topological. Uh, topological, sorry. And uh, uh, because we are taking the key homology of a, of a classical topological space. And this side is very computational. It's very easy to, I mean, technic theoretically speaking, it's easy to compute because you can use all the familiar uh, machinery from algebraic topology uh, or the exact sequences. You can break up this CW complex B gamma into contractible pieces and then uh, compute the K homology of the, the, this entire space from the little building blocks. And the right-hand side is very different. The right-hand side, uh, it's very analytical. Well, you can see it involves a C-star algebra. And uh, it actually captures some of the representational, representation theoretical information of the group gamma. And at the same time, this right-hand side is very hard to compute. Well, we don't have the machinery of algebraic topology, but the usual machinery, because oftentimes this uh, algebra is so non-commutative, you cannot break this apart into ideals, like we have seen in Rufus' talk uh, a couple of weeks ago, right? So for a non-commutative uh, algebra, especially a simple algebra, it's really hard to really use mayer vittori sequence, the usual mayer vittori sequences to help you compute the K-theory. Well, uh, and we have this map. This map should be considered as a kind of higher index map. It's a kind of higher index map. And uh, uh, so what you're really doing is, this is extending the classical Atiyah Singer index map on a, a compact manifold. So uh, you are taking a so-called higher index, which extracts more information uh, from the topological data. All right, so I probably have already thrown you off by presenting this very technical uh, starting point. Now let's look at some motivations. Why do we actually care to study this conjecture? Well, the motivation actually ultimately comes from uh, manifolds, especially what I may call rigidity phenomena of manifolds. So if you give me a Riemannian manifold, I can think of this manifold as containing many layers of data. Like at the top level, we have the Riemannian metric structure, right, given by the uh, Riemannian by inner products on each tangent space. And then this gives you the geometric uh, information. But below that, you have a smooth structure, right? just uh, patching together uh, Euclidean spaces in a very smooth way. And then below that, we have homeomorphism type. Uh, and even below that, more uh, a weaker uh, layer of data is the homotopy type. So you can also think about uh, the corresponding symmetry groups of, of these guys. So if you have a symmetry of the of the manifold that preserves the Riemannian metric, we call this the isometry group, right? And then preserving the smooth structure, that's the diffeomorphism group. Yep. And uh, homeomorphism type, maybe homeo. Uh, wait, why did I write G? I should erase that G here. and their homeomorphism uh, group. And you can also talk about homotopy actions of groups on the manifold. So each layer 
is uh, weaker than the previous one. It, uh, it's a foundation of the previous one. If you determine higher, higher level layer uh, data, you also determine the lower level data. So what is rigidity? Rigidity is when lower level data determine or abstract higher level data. So I'm gonna give you two examples of this kind of phenomena. So the first is the celebrated Novikov conjecture. Uh, it's one of the central problems in uh, topology, differential topology. So it says the so-called higher signatures of a smooth orientable manifold, uh, and that's more than one, by the way. So for each manifold, you can define there's a family of higher signatures. So they are invariant under oriented homotopy equivalences. So how do I see this as a, a kind of rigidity statement? So this higher signature, I'm not going to tell the definition, but I'm just going to tell you that uh, this guy a priori is defined. Let me do it this way. So higher signature is defined using a smooth structure. Uh, but Novikov, he proved in a very striking theorem uh, Uh, that uh, this only depends on the homeomorphism type of the manifold. So that's his theorem. And that's part of the reason why he got a Fields medal. And then he conjectured, well, certainly man's greedy, not only homeomorphism type, but we can go one, one level lower, that this uh, higher signature is actually, it only depends on homotopy type. That's his conjecture. So from this perspective, you can see it's a kind of rigidity phenomenon. And uh, uh, another motivation is the gromov lawson conjecture. Uh, in the original form, it says an a spherical manifold does not support any positive scalar metric. So uh, the scalar metric, I, I mean, we have seen also talks on positive scalar metric problem. Uh, it's again a very interesting and uh, uh, far-reaching problem. So you just ask if uh, you're, you're given a smooth manifold and you ask if I can assign a Riemannian metric on the manifold so that the scalar curvature, uh, oops, positive scalar curvature, I'm sorry. Ah, yes, so here positive scalar metric means a met Riemannian metric with positive scalar curvature. So uh, so if I can assign a Riemannian metric so that uh, the, uh, the scalar curvature is everywhere positive. And uh, this is by itself is, you can say uh, it depends on the Riemannian structure, right? That's what curvature depends on. And it's also very local because curvature is computed locally. But very surprisingly, uh, it has, this problem has global obstructions. So, I guess you can even go down to homotopy type. So being as aspherical means uh, this manifold, for this manifold M, its universal cover M tilde is contractible. Uh, so it, it's uh, homotopy equivalent to a point. So this is really a, only homotopy data of the manifold. So you are saying, uh, this homotopy data obstructs the existence of positive scalar uh, uh, curvature metric. All right. And uh, I'm being very, uh, I mean, being very sketchy today uh, on the, the motivations. So I'm giving another talk on June 24th, uh, where hopefully I will give a uh, more detailed account on uh, some of the motivations. Okay, anyway, hopefully I have convinced you that uh, this seemingly technical conjecture in NCG has far-reaching applications in differential topology and uh, uh, differential geometry. All right, so let's look at some uh, milestone results. And by the way, I should say at the beginning that this is a very incomplete list of results. Uh, so, uh, so I'm organizing this in the following way. So 
because our focus is on this rational strong object of conjecture. So I'm saying this conjecture holds for discrete group gamma. Oh, by the way, I should say, uh, this, is a, this conjecture is not a, uh, it's not only a yes or no question, right? So it's not one of the conjectures that says, like either make it or break, make or break. You can prove this conjecture for a class of groups, not for all groups, but for only a class of groups. And then you instantly get applications to uh, these questions for manifolds whose fundamental groups fall into that class. Right. So uh, you can do this class by class. Right. So the following classes of groups have been uh, shown to satisfy the rational strong object of conjecture. The first class I want to present is uh, given by, well, it's proved by Hickson and Kasparov in the early 2000s, I think uh, 2001 probably. So the conjecture is satisfied if gamma acts isometrically and properly on a Hilbert space. And from now I'm going to just denote the Hilbert space, Hilbert space by H. Uh, so on the Hilbert space, we have the usual L2 metric right, given by the L2 norm. So being isometric simply means uh, this action uh, preserves the metric. On the other hand, uh, what is being proper? So I should give you a definition of uh, proper action. So being proper means, well, here's one way to look at this. So if you write your countable group as gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, you just enumerate all the elements of the group. And you look at, and you fix a point. Actually, it doesn't matter if you fix a particular point or fix any point. You just fix a point in your uh, Hilbert space, for example, the origin. And you look at the distance between this point and uh, it's translate under this action. You want this to go to infinity. As i goes to infinity. So for example, if you have z acting on r, where you view r as a uh, Hilbert space, just by translation, uh, the action is by translation, then this is satisfied really, because you are marching off to infinity uh, and then this distance gets larger. Uh, on the other hand, if you consider an action of z, on any action of z on say S1, any compact space in fact, then you are trapped in a compact space then this kind of condition will never be uh, true. So that's what proper means. In a, uh, so intuitively, this means this action kind of captures the geometry of the group. So R looks somewhat like Z, especially from a cost geometric point of view, but S1 looks nothing like Z. Okay, uh, so this condition gives a very uh, vast class of groups. For example, oh, well, this condition is also called uh, 18 minability, also called the Hall group property. And in particular, if your group gamma is amenable, or if your group gamma is a free group, then this condition is satisfied. And if, if you are a topologist, this kind of result would seem very surprising because uh, originally, say, if you focus on Novikov conjecture, it's a conjecture, it's a purely topological conjecture. But this class of groups is defined analytically. Uh, well, especially say, if you look at amenability, it's, a, it's an analytical property of the group. So if you use topological methods to attack the Novikov conjecture, uh, at least so far, there's no way to prove a result of this flavor in this generality. So you, you, can, you probably will have to as assume your group has some decomposition, some kind of finite dimension uh, property, but not uh, this such a uh, general class of groups like amenability. Uh, more direct, more results in this direction. So, Ho Liang Yu proved uh, that this uh, that the conjecture holds if gamma coarsely embeds into Hilbert space. This is in fact a, a weaker condition. So, being so, I'm not going to actually repeat the definition of cost embedding here, but it basically says uh, we don't need to have an action as long as uh, you embed gamma in the space such that uh, the geometry of the group is kind of reflected by, uh, by the background space, the Hilbert space here, then, then it, it works. Uh, 
So it's a weaker condition. Uh, but on the other hand, in fact, Hicks and Kasparov proved a stronger conclusion, which is that when gamma satisfies this, then the baum kong conjecture holds. Uh, so uh, with this weaker condition, we can only get the Novikov conjecture. And from this result, so this result is, turns out to be very useful, uh, Guoliang Yu's result. Maybe I should start using highlighter. So why is it very useful? Because uh, this condition here is a very general geometric condition. So lots of different classes of groups uh, can be shown to satisfy this, uh, the Novikov conjecture or the uh, strong Novikov conjecture simply by trying to construct coarse embeddings from these groups into Hilbert spaces. I'm gonna mention just one particular result uh, by Gantner Hicks and the Weinberger. So it says if gamma is a subgroup of a Lie group or uh, a subgroup of the following uh, general linear group for any abelian ring R, then uh, it falls into uh, this class. I, I mean, it causes embeds into Hilbert space and then hence it satisfies the, uh, the strong Novikov conjecture. Okay. Then the next result I, result I want to talk about is uh, uh, actually goes, going back in time. Kasparov in 1988, I think, uh, proved the following result. So the conjecture holds if your group gamma acts isometrically and properly, just as before, right? just as what we had here. Uh, it acts on the so-called Adama manifold. So what is an Adama manifold? It's a simply connected complete Riemannian manifold with non-positive sectional curvature. All right, lots of adjectives. Uh, but, oops, something's missing here, it seems. Anyway, uh, so I'm not going to uh, repeat all the definitions, uh, what is sectional curvature here, but maybe let me give you a, a reformulation of this condition. An Adama manifold is simply a complete uh, cat zero Riemannian manifold. So let me pass this a little bit. So it's a manifold, Riemannian manifold, which means it's a metric space, right? And being complete, well, you can think of this as being complete in a uh, metric setting as a metric space. And what is cat zero? So cat zero is a kind of non-positive curvature condition defined in the following way. So it's defined for all geodesic metric spaces. Uh, and here, by the way, being geodesic simply means between any two points, you can find a geodesic connecting them. So any two points, X and Y, can be connected by a, a geodesic. And the geodesic is a, a, is, is a length minimizing uh, curve in the space. So uh, it's k zero if for any geodesic triangle, so let me draw a geodesic triangle in the space. So that consists of three uh, vertices. Let me say this is my space X. You have three points X, Y, and Z. And then uh, you have ge uh, geodesics connecting them. And then whenever you have this uh, geodesic triangle, you can draw a so-called comparison triangle inside R2. such that uh, all the three sides have the same length. And then you can pick uh, the midpoint here, say between Y and Z, and you can connect X and M. Similarly here, you have the three points, let's call them X bar, Y bar, and Z bar. And you find the midpoint M bar, and you connect the midpoint with, uh, with X bar. And the condition here, so we have the following condition. We have uh, the distance between X and M 
is no more than the distance inside R2 between the comparison points X bar and M bar. So what does this mean? This means my triangle really looks very thin. Right? So you can think of this as, uh, well, in general, we draw triangles in a hyperbolic space in the following way. And being K0 is a generalization of being a hyperbolic space. So, this, so these triangles, you can see, they are much slimmer than a typical triangle in the Euclidean space. And that's a defining, uh, uh, characterizing uh, property of, uh, of K0 space. OK, let's see some examples. One example is if you have uh, the group of integers, or z to the n, acting on r to the n. So r to the n is a flat space, a flat manifold that has zero curvature everywhere. And certainly it satisfies this K0 condition. And uh, more generally, how do we see uh, negative curvature? We can look at hyperbolic plane, or more generally hyperbolic spaces. And you have lots of groups acting on them. For example, if you look at uh, uh, H2, then you have uh, the Fuchsian groups acting on them. Uh, and another very interesting example is if you look at uh, the special linear group SLNR and you model it out by the max compact group uh, SON, and then there's on the other side, you have uh, an action by this lattice SLNZ. Well, this space here is, uh, is K0, is actually Adama manifold. And uh, uh, well, there's a canonical metric assigned to it. It's a, in fact a symmetric space uh, of non-compact type. And uh, this action over here, it's easy to see that it's an isometric action. And because it's a lattice, uh, it's actually a discrete subgroup, you can also uh, see that it's, uh, this action is proper. It's very spread out. So uh, this kind of example actually generalizes to any discrete subgroups of a reductive Lie group. You replace SL and R by reductive, reductive Lie group, uh, replace this by, uh, by uh, its maximal compact subgroup, and this is a discrete subgroup over here acting on, on this quotient. So this result in 1988, uh, that was a major breakthrough, and it really gives you lots of different class of groups. All right, and if you contrast this with the uh, later result of Gantner, Hicks, and Weinberger, uh, this later result actually improves on what I said here in that uh, you don't have to assume you have discrete subgroups of Lie groups. You can have all subgroups, countable subgroups of Lie groups. Okay, uh, let's see. Oh, again, this list is very incomplete. Uh, I didn't mention a lot of uh, interesting and uh, amazing works. Uh, for example, uh, Kasparov Skandalis on uh, actions on body spaces, and also Kasparov Yu on uh, uh, groups which cause embed into finite spaces with property H. So, all kinds of uh, extensions and generalizations. And uh, uh, also, I should, also I, sh I should mention that. Uh, if you just focus on the topic of conjecture, there's, uh, different, there are different approaches also using NCG methods. Uh, for example, Kong proved uh, not of conjecture for diffeomorphism groups, but you have to put the restriction on, the, uh, on which higher signatures, which classes you, you, you can deal with. Uh, so in Kong's case, it's the uh, 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 Gale von Fuchs class with my mind for a moment. And uh, also, uh, there's a result by Matai, uh, which proves all uh, uh, classes with degree up to, up to two. So two very different uh, directions of results. The first is you put restrictions on, on the geometry of the, of the group, like what I listed here. Then you can get all higher signatures of nautical conjecture. But uh, there's another, direction where you put the restrictions on the, uh, on which higher signatures you can uh, deal with. All right. Uh, so coming to our main results. So our question here is, 
if you look at these two results I listed here, Hicks and Kasparov, and also Kasparov, so they look very similar. They both say we have a group acting asymmetrically and properly on some, some metric space. Just the space is very different. So here, the first, first case, the space is a Hilbert space. It's infinite, it could be infinite dimensional, usually it's infinite dimensional in fact, uh, but it's flat, has no curvature. While here we have a, a finite dimensional manifold, but you are allowed to have non-positive curvatures. So we ask if we can uh, combine these two results. So what if you have a group gamma which acts isometrically and properly, just as before, but now on a, positively, uh, a possibly infinite dimensional non-positively curved space. So I'm being a bit vague here. So what is this kind of space? I'll define it later. So let me uh, just state our main result here. So the rational strong Novikov conjecture, the conjecture I listed at the very beginning, holds for groups acting asymmetrically and properly on uh, this class of spaces, admissible Hilbert Adamas spaces. Uh, so let me define this class of space. And when I define this, I want you to think of this as an infinite dimensional non-positively curved space. So the technical, uh, the rigorous definition is the following. So this space is a complete K0 geodesic metric space whose tangent cones embed isometrically into Hilbert spaces. So let's pause this a little bit. So first it's a metric space, right? And more of it's geodesic metric space. Geodesic metric space. Uh, so since it's geodesic, we can define K0. Uh, and K0, remember that this is a notion of non-positive curvature. So that's how we capture uh, the idea of non-positively curved. And we also require this to be complete, as usual. Right? And then there's an extra condition which says this space looks like a, an infinite dimensional manifold. So this condition is the following. So if you look at the tangent cones, so let me just explain a little bit about what is a tangent cone. So if you have a geodesic metric space, say this is your space X, you fix a base point X zero, and you have all kinds of geodesics going out. So if you just zoom in, just imagine you zoom in, uh, very close to x0, then all these geodesics will look like they're getting straighter and straighter. Right? So in the limit, so if you zoom in, in the limit, you may get a space which looks like uh, you have all the straight rays coming out of this x0. That's the geodesic cone. So for a manifold, if you do this construction, it recovers the usual tangent space as a metric space. Uh, if you have a manifold with boundary, then if you do this construction at the, bound, at the boundary point, then you will only see a half space. So you only see your uh, point is here and you have all these rays going in this direction, but you have nothing over here. Uh, if you do this construction on a tree, say uh, at a vertex point with say uh, three edges, then, well, of course the tree has more edges farther away, but if you just do this construction, which means you're zooming in, you're just remembering the local structure, which is you have three uh, infinite rays coming out of this vertex. And uh, what's kind of strange about this, uh, this tangent cone is all these rays have degree, uh, have angle pi apart from each other. That's from the definition of, of the, uh, the tangent cone, really. So every pair of different uh, edges give you kind of opposite rays. Uh, all right, so, so that's a tangent cone. So we are requiring that our tangent cone embed isometri isometrically into Hilbert space. So this is like, uh, local, it says locally it looks somewhat like a manifold, but it may be infinite dimensional. Okay, so that's the definition of a Hilbert Adamas space. Again, it's an infinite dimensional non positively curved space. And that's also, I should also uh, explain this adjective admissible in our theorem. We want this space to be admissible. 
So admissibility requires we have uh, a sequence of increasing uh, subspaces such that every subspace is closed, convex, and isometric to the Riemannian manifold. All right, and also these subspaces uh, they exhaust X uh, in a topological sense, so the union is dense. So this means I can build up my space using finite dimensional Riemannian manifolds. And here convex, I should uh, have been explained convex. So convex simply means, uh, let me just draw a picture. So if you have a subspace X1, so what does convex mean? Convex means if you have any two points in the subspace, the geodesic connecting them must fall in X1, right? So uh, geodesic, so maybe, maybe write this way. So for any X and Y in my X, in my subspace XI, the geodesic between X and Y, let me just use this notation. Well, in fact, in a casual space, uh, the geodesic is unique. So I can, uh, without uh, ambiguity, write this. The, ge the entire geodesics, geodesic between these two points, as considered in the bigger space, completely fall into the smaller space. Uh, so as you, if you think about this, this just captures convexity uh, for a linear space. Right? So the straight line is the geodesic, and that falls into the subspace. Uh, okay, so this condition should be thought of as uh, bringing us closer to the case of manifolds. So we have another kind of manifold-like condition on our space. So let's look at some examples of this class of uh, metric spaces. So the old, uh, old examples, Adama manifolds and also Hilbert spaces. So they are both K0, right? In the case of Hilbert spaces, it's infinite dimensional, but flat, so it's K0. Uh, they in fact both satisfy, uh, they are both Hilbert Adama spaces. So as I said, in the case of Adama manifolds, uh, the tangent cone is a tangent space. So it, it's a Euclidean, Euclidean space. In the case of the Hilbert space, uh, the tangent cone at every point is the same Hilbert space. So again, uh, it satisfies our condition that the tangent cone embeds into Hilbert space. And they are both admissible. Uh, so it's trivial for other manifolds because it's already a finite dimensional manifold. But for Hilbert space, you can always take a, an increasing, uh, well, I guess I should say separable Hilbert space here, to be precise. You can take an increasing, uh, family of uh, finite dimensional subspaces. There's, uh, in contrast, if you look at trees, they are K0, uh, which is uh, easy to verify, but their tangent cones look very strange. They look like this. So they have, you have these rays coming out, but they are, every pair is opposite. Uh, so uh, you cannot embed such a space into a Euclidean space. So for trees, uh, they are not Hilbert Adama spaces. And in this way, we can see that uh, our class of spaces cover the previous two uh, classes in, in these results up here. So our result, uh, in a sense, partially generalizes uh, the results of Hicks and Kasparov and Kasparov for rational strong non of conjecture. Uh, but, well, that's not all. We, we don't, I mean, we can unify earlier results, uh, but we want more examples. So how can we get more examples? Here's a very interesting construction. So before I explain this construction, let's, let me make a remark. So if you have uh, X and Y, X and Y both are admissible Hilbert Adama spaces, then if you take the product space, and if, since we are dealing with metric spaces, we need to assign a metric. So on the product space, let's assign the L2 metric. Uh, so what's the L2 metric? Simply, uh, you have D squared of, uh, you're simply just summing up uh, the, the squares of the two uh, metri metrics, Y1 and Y2. 
and that's uh, your uh, the metric on the product space squared. Mm -hmm. So that's the distance between the pairs. So uh, in this case, if you look at a tangent cone, it will again be a L2 product of the two tangent cones. So again, we'll uh, embed into a Hilbert space. So inspired by this uh, elementary remark, uh, we can define the following very interesting construction called the L2 continuum product. So what is that? So this, the, the setting here is we have a metric space X and we are also given say a finite measure space Y with a measure mu. And we define the following metric space L2 of Y mu with X. So this is a space of all measurable functions from Y into X that satisfy uh, an L2 integrability condition. So I'm gonna explain this condition uh, a bit later, uh, but let's first think how to define a metric on it. So the metric is defined in the following way. So we want to, this is a space of functions, right? We want to define the distance between two functions, C and eta. So it's defined by this integral. So you evaluate both functions at the same point and then take the distance inside X. Right? So this is the distance inside X. You square it and then integrate using that measure over the entire space. So it's a kind of L2 average of all the uh, fiberwise distances. Uh, and then you can first verify this is in fact a, in fact a metric. Uh, and then this L2 integrability condition simply means that uh, my, I'm only looking at uh, all the functions where the distance between this and the constant function, any constant function in fact, is finite. Right, so, so we have a new metric space. Uh, it's huge, usually. Uh, it's usually infinite, I mean, infinite dimensional. And uh, what's crucial here is this construction really behaves very well with uh, our class of uh, Hilbert-Adama spaces in the following way. So if you have uh, an admissible Hilbert-Adama space and you have a finite metric space which is separable, so separable here simply means, for example, L2 of Y mu is a separable uh, Hilbert space. Uh, and then the conclusion is, if you take this construction, L2 continuum product, this is again an admissible Hilbert Adama space. So using this construction, we can, we can obtain lots of interesting examples. So a key example is the following. So it's called the space of L2 Riemannian metrics. So how do we define it? So the setting here is we have a closed smooth manifold that's called N. And then we, we pick a density, just fix a density on N. So what's a density? Density is a, a, a Lebesgue-like measure on N. So uh, if you think of N as uh, piecing together different Euclidean patches, so on, on every patch you pick a, a, a smooth, uh, well, a, a measure which is uh, absolutely continuous with the Lebesgue measure and so that the derivative is smooth and then you put them together, that's a density on my uh, manifold. So if you're more familiar with a volume form, you can just think of a volume form without uh, the orientation. So I'm not requiring my manifold to be orientable here. So anyway, it's a measure on, on my manifold end. So let me make an observation here. So if you look at, uh, the, the space of all positive definite n by n matrices with determinant one. So this space, I claim it's the same as this space we've seen before, the quotient space of SLNR by SON. So why is this the case? Well, that's because we can uh, take an action of SLNR on the space of positive definite matrices uh, simply by uh, congruence action. So you multiply uh, 
an element from SLNR from the left and uh, from the right, while you take the, uh, the, the, the transpose on, on one end, that defines an action. And then uh, you look at the, uh, the stabilizer group of uh, CD identity matrix, then uh, that gives you SON. So that's how you identify these two spaces. Now, once you have this identification, you can assign a canonical Riemannian metric on this space. This space now gets the structure of uh, a symmetric space of non-compact type. Uh, in particular, it's Adama manifolds. Oops, sorry. And why did I mention this, this fact here? Because I'm going to look at the space of all Riemannian metrics on my manifold N. So what is a Riemannian metric? At every point in your manifold N, you have to assign an inner product on the uh, tangent space, right? So, and every inner product, if you choose a, a coordinate, co uh, coordinate, then you get really a positive definite N by N matrix. Uh, so the space of all Riemannian metrics on N, uh, fixing this density, right? If you are if you fix a Riemannian uh, metric, then it also gives you uh, the canonical volume form locally or canonical density. It tells you, if you fix the distances, it tells you how to integrate. It, fix it, it tells you the volume. Uh, so if, if you look at all these uh, Riemannian metrics, it's the same as the space of all smooth sections of an SLNR over SO bundle over N, because at every point you are fixing uh, such a matrix. And determin determinant one condition here corresponds to that you are uh, fixing this uh, density here. All right. So from this space, you can take an L2 completion. And that lands you into this uh, space of L2 Riemannian matrix, which can be also defined as an L2 continuum product. Uh, you take this space as the fiber, as the target space, and then you look at all uh, measurable functions from your manifold into the uh, this fiber, uh, because we're looking at L2 functions. This kind of top, uh, the topological non-triviality of the of the bundle doesn't really matter, so we're just looking at functions. Okay, so so why is this relevant? Why is this interesting? So we we get an interesting well space which contains the space of all many metrics. So what gives? Uh, if you look at the group of diffeomorphisms, if you pick a countable subgroup or any subgroup, it actually acts on uh, the space of L2 Riemannian metrics. How? Well, it acts on the space of Riemannian metrics simply by inducing Riemannian metrics, right? You have a diffeomorphism, you can induce new metrics using the diffeomorphism. Uh, and this action extends onto an action on the L2 space, on the L2 completion. And a key point here is this uh, action is isometric. Uh, really, that's because locally this action looks like uh, action by SLNR. And your uh, metric here is built up using these fiberwise, integrating these fiberwise uh, metrics. So you can just quickly show that this is an isometric action. So uh, this brings us to, uh, to, to our theorem. So you have a group which uh, acts by diffeomorphism on, on a manifold, say fixing a volume, then uh, as long as this induced action is proper, then we can say that uh, we can apply our theorem. So you may ask, when is this action proper? Well, this action is proper if, well, I have to define, define a function. We call this lambda plus, uh, it's supposed to be like a like a length function. So this G is a diffeomorphism. Say fixing this uh, omega. So we define this uh, lambda plus function to be. Uh, let's see. So we have the log of uh, the the operator norm of the following, following a linear map. So here we have it squared. I'm gonna explain this. 
Oops. Okay. So this G is a different morphism, right? And this dx uh, G is the, the derivative of G at X. So as a derivative, that's a linear map uh, from the, between the tangent spaces, right? So it's from tangent space at X to the tangent space at N uh, at GX. And uh, we fix, uh, fix a Riemannian metric on, on N. Once I fix the Riemannian metric, these tangent spaces become uh, inner product spaces. So we can define, uh, we can take the operator norm. So this is the operator norm. And we take the log, we square it, and then we uh, take, the, take the integral. Well, I forgot to take a square root on the outside. So we have such a map. This map uh, is almost a length function in the sense that uh, if you have the, the composition of two different morphisms, it's no more, the length of this guy, the lambda plus of this guy is no more than uh, the sum of the individual components. Uh, and uh, this action uh, is proper if we call, if gamma is so-called geometric, geometrically discrete, and that's defined by saying that this lambda plus of G, let's say GI, goes to infinity as I goes to infinity. Once you enumerate uh, the elements of your group. And it doesn't matter how you enumerate, really. So let me say, so this is this may still look a bit technical. So why did I define such a uh, such an integral here? So this integral here really tells you how how much your diffeomorphism deforms or distorts your uh, your metric, and then uh, uh, the 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 more it distorts the metric, the larger this value is, and distort it measures this in a L two average way. So uh, so. We, our theorem applies to the case when you have a subgroup, which really distorts the metric quite a lot, Riemannian metric quite a lot. On the other hand, if you look at the case when uh, the, 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 the group action fixes a Riemannian metric, then that's saying, so let me actually give you a big picture description. So you have uh, the different morphism of, all different morphism on, on N, then uh, if you have, it fixes uh, a metric G, then your group gamma is uh, in the isometry group of MG. The isometry group of a closed manifold here is, uh, many manifold is a Lie group. So you can apply the theorem of Gantner Hickson and the Weinberger to say it satisfies the strong Novikov conjecture. While for us, the, the case of uh, the, the groups we look at is in a sense at the very opposite end. It's so-called geometrically discrete. So uh, by our theorem, we also get Novikov conjecture. So you may ask, what about all the, all the other different Muslim groups in, in between? So perhaps this gives you hope to extend the results to kind of uh, bridge the gap in between. And I should also make a remark that, uh, or maybe, well, no, maybe I should just uh, go on. I don't have too much time. So let me maybe skip the strategy part. Just mention one word that, uh, one sentence, which is that uh, the key point of our proof is to construct a C star algebra, A of X, from a Hilbert Adamas space. This is an infinite dimensional space, so you cannot take the C0 functions on the space because there's no interest in C0 functions on the non-locally compact space. Uh, but we, we, we found a way to define such a C star algebra which behaves nicely. In particular, the K theory behaves uh, uh, fairly well uh, and uh, 
we, so that we can define a bot map to carry out uh, uh, a kind of direct do direct strategy. But uh, we still need another technique, a new technique called the deformation technique of the action uh, that uh, really allows us to, to, to complete the proof. And uh, for groups with torsion, we also need to use the uh, KK theory with real coefficients that uh, you heard about last week uh, from Paulo. And then at the end, let me just mention some open problems. Uh, the first problem is we have, I just said this uh, C star algebra A of X, Unfortunately, I didn't have time to really define it. Uh, but one nagging problem we had is we didn't actually uh, uh, compute the, completed the K-theory of this C algebra. We only know it has a canonical copy coming from, uh, uh, coming from the, uh, the bot map. So if you can compute, so conjecturally, the K-theory of this guy for any uh, cube atom mass space should be Z for K1 and zero for k0. So if you can show this, and you can make, if you can show the bottom map really induces this isomorphism, uh, then uh, we can get a much better result. We can even get, for example, uh, results replacing actions by cost embeddings. And another, another problem is uh, cost embeddings to and from Hilbert Anomar spaces. So there are lots of work on cost embeddings of uh, Banach spaces, Hilbert spaces and Banach spaces. Uh, so you may ask whether this space embeds into other Banach spaces or, what, or the other way around. Uh, so in particular, if you look at this space of L2 Riemannian matrix and omega and SL over SO, oops, sorry. We don't quite know if it embeds, I mean, I think it should probably not embed into a Hilbert space, even though each individual fiber embeds into a Hilbert space. Uh, but once you do this L2 completion, the compression function uh, of the cost embedding really gets destroyed. Uh, and also, uh, it, there's a conjecture whether, uh, whether every bounded geometry cost space embeds into a cas zero space, uh, I think, uh, costly. Uh, so that's also relevant. And also, uh, one last question is about an admissibility. So whether we can actually remove it or whether every cube atom space is admissible. So if you're interested, talk to me and I can say more, but uh, I'm, I've used up my time. So thank you for listening. Thank you. So do you have any questions or comments? Oh, yeah, he's, please. I, I, just a simple question is SLNZ acting on the N torus? I mean, of course, we know enough for SLNZ, mm -hmm. but is that an example of um, the geometrically finite? Uh, so SLNZ? Uh, and okay. the properness uh, Z? on the torus? Yes, that's uh, geometrically, discrete. geometrically discrete. Yes. It actually satisfies a stronger condition. So these. Uh, these uh, operator norms of the diffeomorphisms, they, the sup norm actually goes to infinity as, as your G goes to infinity. So that's a bit stronger. Oh, okay. So uh, I guess I goes to infinity here. So, uh, so if you have this stronger condition, you can actually, whenever you have this con condition, you can say your group actually closely embeds into SL over SO. And then you can use uh, older techniques uh, to prove this. But for us, we have this L2 average. If you look at the definition of the, of the lambda plus function over here. So we're taking all these uh, kind of distortions, all these operator norms, we're taking an L2 average. So that should be weaker, right? Or well, that is weaker. I, I have one other quick question also is, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know anything about, I've always sort of wondered about groups that uniformly embed in a non-positively curved space. As far as I know, nothing was ever proved about them. Is that, has that changed? Or if you have a coarse, a uniform embedding into a cat, into a Hadamard's, into a Hadamard's, for example, is anything known about uh, that? 
Cool. Well, well, we're trying to do something about it. So in the literature, I don't know if this has been proven. I haven't found anything. Uh, so, so let me just explain this a little bit. So, so he's asked about, uh, uh, so I, I presented this, this result of Kasparov, which says if you have an action, nice action on the Adama manifold, then you can get an optical conjecture. But if you weaken this, weaken this to a coarse embedding, then in this generality, I guess we don't know. Uh, because if you think about, compare this with a Hilbert space case, in the Hilbert space case, if you want to get a Novikov conjecture, you need to use the fact that embeddings into Hilbert spaces really correspond nicely uh, to uh, conditionally negative type functions. And with those functions, you get nice like convexity properties that you can, you can exploit. But uh, embeddings into Adama manifolds, that's, uh, that's more mysterious, I guess, more general. Wow. Uh, Andrew, are you talking about uh, finite dimensional, infinite dimensional here? Wait. Finite dimensional, even, I think. Um, I, sorry, right. can I comment on that? Uh, I think in, in both either infinite or finite, it's known expanders don't embed into Hadamard manifolds. Yeah, that's, yeah. For general exactly. spaces, it's open. But, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I so guess we need. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a conjecture by Glomov whether any bounded geometry space costly embedding into a cat zero space. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can be yeah. Rule zero is open, but manifolds are too yeah. restricted. Yeah. yeah, I guess regarding what Rufus said, the crucial point is we need to have a bound on the sectional curvature uh, in order for to to avoid the to to prevent the, the embedding of a, an expander. So if you lose this bound, if you go to infinite dimension and lose this bound on the sectional curvature, I don't know if. Uh, we still have this, or, or maybe Rufus knows. Some um, I, I'd have to check the results. My memory is you don't need that, but um, but I'd have to okay. check as long as I thought about this. So I should make a comment. The uh, here, but Adam space we are talking about it's not a manifold. It can have mm -hmm. cover to infinity. Uh, so there is like some subtle difference. Uh, so maybe I also mentioned that uh, uh, Gromov recently visited Texas A&M. I talked to him about, you know, the admissibility, and he said that he he he's, he conjectures that every space like this is admissible. So if someone can find an example, that's just the last question Tian Chao asked. It's a it's a curious problem. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it might be possible if we uh, look at, we can construct these Hilbert spaces from say for normal algebras. If you look at non-injective for normal algebras, it's possible that we get non-admissible Hilbert spaces. But so far I haven't thought too much into it, about it. Yeah, that would be interesting, yeah. It's... Okay, thank you. Do you have any more questions or comments? Okay, let's thank Jen Zhao again for a beautiful talk.